Hello, and welcome to the Sinobabble podcast. This week, as promised, we're turning away from the Nanjing decade and the KMT and the nationalist government and Chiang Kai-shek, and we're switching our focus back onto the communists. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the foundations of one of the most important ideologies of the 20th century, Mao Zedong thought the foundational ideology of the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Republic of China. It was formed over a fairly long period of time, I would probably say Mao's entire lifetime, and so it's really important that we discuss Mao's ideology in the context of the different stages of his life, which is what we'll be doing today. And today, I have a very special guest on the podcast with me. Hi, my name is Emily Matson, and I am a PhD student in the History Department at the University of Virginia, studying 20th century Chinese history in particular. Great. Welcome to the podcast, Emily. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely to be here. <laughs> okay, so like I said, today we're talking about Mao Zedong and his ideology, and we're going to talk about it in the context of three sort of analytical frameworks. So the first one is something called the great man theory. The other one is obviously Marxism, and we're going to be discussing to what extent Mao could be considered a Marxist. And then finally, we're going to be talking about the mythology and mythologizing of CCP history and what purpose that serves in modern day state building in China. So Emily, do you want to start us off by explaining what exactly is the great man theory? Sure. So the great man theory, it was more in vogue among historians in the 19th century when it was established than today. But today, I think a lot of people in the general public end up still kind of assuming that this theory is the case, even though in academia and the historical discipline, we've moved away from it. So the great man theory was first really proposed by a historian named Thomas Carlyle, who argued that world history is nothing more than a collection of biographies belonging to great men. This theory has a couple main assumptions. One, that certain leaders are born, so this would be nature, not nurture. They're born with these certain traits that distinguish them from their peers. And two, that especially in times of social crisis, these leaders are apt to arise. And so according to the great man theory, I mean, Mao was a main driving force in modern Chinese history. He was very unique, and it was as much or more of his nature than his nurture that caused him to be such a prime mover in 20th century China. It makes sense, I think, that it arose during the 19th century, considering all of the things that France had just been through with the revolutions and things like that. So I think people were probably backhandedly talking about Napoleon (laughs) a little bit. Yeah, it makes sense that we've moved away from it today as well because postmodernism is so much more popular and that it's like grand narratives do not exist. But I think, yeah, I think it is kind of an everyman framework for understanding this sort of thing. I think most people believe in a sort of nature versus nurture debate in that kind of sense. So yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Do you also want to explain to the audience what Marxism is? (laughs) I'm sure. This will be like Marxism light or Marxism (laughs) 101. So this is important because uh, Mao is considered to be a very unorthodox Marxist. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about orthodox Marxism a little so later we can juxtapose it with what Mao adds to the ideology. So Marx is this 19th century German guy who um, writes three volumes um, called Kapital, That is the most boring book in history, by the way. If anyone chooses to read it, it's just so boring. I recommend you just read the Spark Notes. (laughs) Right, it is pretty boring. I've read through part of the first volume, but that's it. So he comes up with most of the material for Capital when he is in England. So the Industrial Revolution is going ahead full force in England at the time, and Marx sees these terrible conditions for workers in these massive factories. And so he starts to develop his theory of um, class struggle as what really motivates It's what really causes history to move forward. Um, So he's kind of teleological in how he views the progression of history, and he adopts a lot from Hegel, actually, in this regard. Although, unlike Hegel, um, he views class struggle as what causes history to move from one stage to the next. 
so first of all, class. What does Marx mean by class? Uh, he means your relationship with the means of production. So if you are the owner of a factory, you own the means of production. If you are a laborer in said factory, you are being exploited by the means of production um, through the um, factory owner. So according to Marx, there are a couple key stages of history. This is sometimes called stage theory. So first would be feudalism. And in each stage of history, you have class struggle, you have a dominant class, and then you have a, another kind of underdog class that um, kind of rises up and challenges the dominant class. So in feudalism, you have the feudal lords as kind of the top dogs, um, and then you have this uh, nascent bourgeoisie class, you can think of them as urban merchants who end up wanting more of a stake in society. Uh, the French Revolution is considered uh, kind of the epitome of the class struggle in the feudal stage of history. And Marx writes about the French Revolution quite a bit as well. So then you move forward from feudalism into the next stage, which is capitalism. So Marx, when he was writing, believed that, okay, this is where England is right now in the Industrial Revolution. It's the stage of capitalism where the bourgeoisie are now the top dogs in society. But then you have this new class called the proletariat. So these would be like the factory workers um, who want more of a stake in society. And they're the ones who are being exploited. So Marx believes that the next revolution to move history forward to the next stage will be carried out by the proletariat against the bourgeoisie. And that um, socialist revolution would move history into the next stage of history, which is socialism. And then eventually you get communism, which to my knowledge, we've never actually seen an example of in real life. It's this kind of utopian ideal where the state withers away and like everyone is kind of in harmony from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. So that ideal is supposed to be fulfilled eventually in this utopian ideal of communism. So that's Marxism 101. Yeah, that's great. Perfect. You're right. That was a really good short explanation. Das Kapital goes on for much longer than that. But yeah, if anyone wants sort of this in written form, you can just read the Communist Manifesto. I think it sums it up pretty nicely. And it's 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 like the nice brief summary. It's it's the notes form. My sort of argument is that Mao wasn't a Marxist at all. Marxism is just something he kind of tacks on to things that he already thinks, feels and believes because that's what's in vogue and he's in the Communist Party so he kind of has to yeah, and when he's becoming a theoretician later on, it takes him until the late 1930s to even start really playing with Marxism at all. And then he just kind of fiddles with it to make it fit in with what he already believes. But we'll get to that in a bit. And yeah, finally, mythology. So I think most people who have a good understanding of the Chinese Communist Party all agree that mythology plays a really important role in sort of state building, in their ideology, in their propaganda and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we're going to be talking about the Long March a little uh, later on in this episode and how, well, the mythology of the Long March is heavily utilized by the Communist Party today as kind of this origin story um, mm -hmm. of heroism, of grit and determination that really crystallizes uh, party ideology and the party vision. So yeah, we'll be talking about that. It comes up multiple times as well because there's certain aspects of like erasure and hyping up certain elements of the CCP or even Mao's personal exploits. And you're kind of like, that That kind of didn't probably happen how they said that it did. But yeah, we'll go through them as we reach them. Okay, so that's the context of this episode. So we're actually going to be starting right at the very beginning and we're going to be talking about Mao Zedong as a child, as a baby, where he was born, where he grew up, and where he was educated. So uh, Mao's um, upbringing, he's from Hunan province, from uh, the um, village of, oh, do you remember the name? I forgot the name. No, it's, oh, Shaoxiang, I think. oh yeah, it's Shaoshan, Shaoshan village, yeah. Yeah. His family is relatively well-to-do, so he is able to receive a classical education growing up. 
Um, when the 1911 revolution happens, he is studying in Hunan's provincial capital of Changsha. And at this point in time, he's arguably still a monarchist, and his boyhood heroes are um, Zheng Guofan, um, you know, this um, Qing statesman who helps put down the Taiping Rebellion, and Kang Yue and Liang Qichao, who are these really famous reformers in the late 19th century. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's where he gets his start. Yeah, and he's really, I think we'll talk about class system in communist China later, but at this point he could probably be classed as like a middle peasant, maybe even a rich peasant. Oh, I would say a rich peasant, yeah, depending yeah. on where you are, right? <laughs> yeah. Because if you're a rich peasant in one area, you can be like a middle peasant or a poor peasant, or even a landlord, you know, it just depends. Mm. Actually, yeah, his family does technically become landlords later on because his dad buys more land over the course of his life and then he starts selling grain as well. So he actually becomes basically a merchant as well. And that's what pays for Mal to go to school because going to school wasn't, you know, not everybody went, especially in the Qing dynasty. Exactly. I mean, the fact that and Mao actually loves classic Chinese literature mm. and he dabbles in poetry himself, I think, at various points in his life. Oh, yes. And he utilizes all these literary references that he learned when he was a boy, getting this classical education. Although he tends to downplay his, you know, family status sometimes because oh, yeah. um, it doesn't really go along with um, the poor peasant being the <laughs> um, most re revolutionary class. Yeah, and he definitely plays up his um, sort of country bumpkin roots later on, even though early on in his career, he's trying to downplay that because he's trying to play with the big boys, basically. But in this period, he's kind of like a, not a big fish in a small pond, but he's, you know, he's an educated guy, he's from a well-to-do family. He does have a wife, actually, briefly, but she dies fairly young. So he's kind of free from the family responsibility of, you know, you have to work on the farm all the time. So he can go off and do his studies and, you know, he's ex he's playing with different ideologies at this time you know he's not really wedded to any kind of idea i think that's probably because of where china is at the time the qing dynasty is failing oh mao's born in 1893 by the way the qing's failing he joins the army for a little while when they come to uh changsha when they come to hunan province and yeah so he's he's kind of involved he's on the forefront of the ideas locally but he's not wedded to anything and so he decides to try and do some leadership stuff right yeah, and he's one of the primary organizers of um, this work-study program. Actually, Mao is influenced by anarchism before he's influenced by Marxism, um, which is not unusual for um, intellectuals in um, the new culture movement. Mao is one of the primary organizers of this work-study program. The goal of the program is to send students to France, actually. So Mao actually goes to Beijing for the first time to accompany these 20 Hunani students who are preparing to go to France, but he doesn't end up accompanying them. Um, some other famous uh, Chinese communist leaders, like I believe Zhou Enlai was in the France work-study program for yeah. a while. but So was Deng Xiaoping, that's where they met. But Mao decides to, you know, stay and hang out in Beijing um, for six months, which um, ends up being a really influential time for him. Yeah, exactly. So it's when he moves to Beijing for this short period. Does he does he move and then move back and then move back again to become a librarian? I believe so, because the initial time he was only in Beijing for half a year. Yeah. I think he goes to like a college or something back in Hunan province for a while because he gets like a discount. I think he has like a Western teacher and everything. That's when he starts really learning sort of English. Uh, he takes some like college classes and different thoughts. And then he in 1918, he, that's when he goes back to Beijing to work there properly in the Beijing University Library. Right. So in September of 1918, he goes to um, work in the Beijing University Library. And this is where he meets Li Dajiao, who ends up being one of the founders of the Chinese Communist Party. A few years later in 1921, 
So Li Da Zhao was a huge advocate of Bolshevism. So it's 1918, the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution is in very, very recent living memory. Li Da Zhao was really excited about the success of the Bolshevik Revolution and thinks that Marxism is pretty great and translates all these Marxist works into Chinese. Now later on, Mao argues that, you know, under Li Da Zhao, like I rapidly developed towards Marxism and oh yeah, Chen Du Xiu was pretty instrumental as well. However, this might be him looking back on this time through rose-colored lenses a bit, because yeah. if you look at his early writings from around this time, there's very little evidence that Marxism had any major impact on his thinking. Yeah, I do. Um, so this is where I it comes to me that, you know, I have to put my hand up and say, I don't think Mao was interested in Marxism at all. I think Mao was more interested in the people. And this is also where the mythologizing begins. So it's at this point that we're like, Okay, Mao's kind of hyping up or bigging up the fact that he was friends with Li Da Zhao. But whenever I read histories of this period, so for example, if you read about it from um, like in a general Chinese textbook or something, Mao's name is never mentioned in this period, even though he worked alongside Li Da Zhao. And Beijing University was the center of the May 4th movement. So I think if Mao was really at the forefront or even, you know, heavily involved. There are some students who weren't at the forefront, but at least their organisations are mentioned. I think Mao's name would have been mentioned by general historians more often, but most people don't really talk about him. He's not really... I would say he's kind of like a like an outsider, almost. Not an outcast, but he's just kind of on the periphery, you know. He's a country bumpkin. Most of these guys are from Beijing or from big cities. They speak English. Some of them have got, um, like, Hu Shi studied in uh, Cornell University. Yeah, just... Mao's pretty embarrassed at this point, you know, <laughs> of his, like, country bumpkin status and tries to downplay it as opposed to later when he tries to really emphasize his connections, like, to the peasants. Exactly, um, yeah. But he, he is, you know, he's trying. He definitely tries. So he starts writing a lot in this period and you know, he's involved, so Chen Dusho, we've mentioned in a previous episode, founded the newspaper, sorry, founded the, well, is it a paper or a journal? I would call it a journal. Yeah. Although Essence. don't ask me for the technical definition or distinction between a journal and a newspaper. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there are these different articles by different leading intellectuals who are published, so it's more about ideas than it would be about current events, although of course the two are very, very much related. Yeah, exactly. So we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll go with journals. So he's Publishing the New Youth Journal, he founds it, I think it's 1915 or something like that. And Mao does actually get a few uh, articles published in it. And this is where you see some of his ideas starting to form. Yeah, um, he returns to Hunan in 1919 and founds his own journal, actually, called um, the Xiang River Review. So the Xiang River Review it only lasts for about five issues before uh, the warlord that controls Hunan at the time is like, no, we should ban this. These ideas are too controversial. But it does end up uh, gaining Mao quite a reputation. Hmm. So two of uh, Mao's earliest published writings are one manifesto on the founding of the Xiang River Review, which was published in the first issue of uh, this journal, and uh, two commentary on the suicide of Miss Zhao. So I remember when I first read the manifesto of the founding of the Xiang River Review, I was taken aback because Mao actually advocates for a bloodless revolution mm-hmm. here. If you think of his later writings, like uh, we'll get to um, his um, report on the peasants in Hunan yeah. later in the episode, I believe, he talks about how like revolution isn't like a dinner party and um, it can't be anything you know so refined yeah. and it has to be bloody. People are going <laughs> to die. Things are going to get crazy. But I mean, in 1919, he advocates for a bloodless revolution. Um, and yeah, democracy with a representative government is the best and nothing in this suggests anything related to Bolshevism or Marxism or communism at all. Yeah, this is really the first time that you get to see Mao's ideas really taking shape and him coming up not just with like the ideological framework but also kind of the practical you know implementation of how the revolution's going to go and he's really thinking sort of long term at this point as opposed to just having a few ideas here and there so this is kind of like the foundation of his thought if you will this is where we start with the Mao Zedong thought idea but yeah as you say most of it kind of gets dropped <laughs> as we go forward in time 
Right. I mean, Mao Zedong thought, I think the phrase is first used, it's sometime during the Yen An years, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, well, if we want to say Mao Zedong thought, being like what Mao Zedong actually thought, then this is our <laughs> first evidence of it, right? Yeah, exactly. The commentary on the suicide of Miss Zhao. So this is another, I don't know if this is a controversial opinion, but I personally think that Mao, at least in his early years, could be considered a feminist. And I think that this commentary, this um, essay that he writes about this lady, is the first signs of how he feels about women. Yeah, I would agree. So recently in the um, discussion sections of Undergrads I'm Leading, we read quite a few of Lu Xun's short stories. I believe you talked about Lu Xun in a previous episode. Lu Xun is also quite a feminist in some of his short stories, such as New Year's Sacrifice. He really portrays women as kind of very symbolic of the oppression of Chinese society overall um, under these like, you know, Confucian, older Confucian ideals. And Mao's commentary on the suicide of Miss Zhao actually reminds me of some of Lu Xun's stuff. He's Mao's very critical, um, like Lu Xun is, of the traditional marriage system <laughs> and believes, like Lu Xun, that women represent the ultimate victims of Confucianism and feudalism. He argues in this piece that well, Miss Zhao, so a little bit of background. Miss Zhao is this uh, young woman in Hunan who commits suicide because she doesn't want to get married to this guy her parents are forcing her to wed. Mao is talking about, like, why did this young lady commit suicide? What are the options open to her? Well, there are not very many options open to her at this point in time, and she's... If Ms. Zhao is dead today, which she is, Mao says it's because she was solidly enclosed by the three iron nets the nets being society, her own family, and her fiancé's family. So I would agree, Mao definitely comes off as a feminist uh, in this early commentary. Yeah, and this is an idea that we see kind of carried through a lot of, not just his writing, but also his personal actions. So a little bit after this, he marries a long-term friend, and also when he joins the Communist Party, she also joins as well. She's called Yang Kai Hui, and they don't actually get married. They kind of have like a free love situation which is carried over from the May 4th movement and right. you also get um, when we talk about the report on peasants it's not a really big part but he says that there is uh, three there are four thick ropes around the peasants and then the fourth rope is specifically on women so women are doubly oppressed by society because it doesn't matter how poor or how oppressed a man is if he has a wife she is even more oppressed this is something that goes forward also into the actual PRC as well. You know, you get the whole women hold up half the sky thing. However, I think his personal attachment to feminism kind of fades as his touch with reality also fades. But yeah, because I, I never felt that he was genuine when he was saying the whole women hold up half the sky thing. But when I actually go back and read him, I'm like, oh, he did actually care about women. Fancy that. <laughs> Yeah, do you remember when he said women hold up half the sky? I know it was later. It's a uh, cultural revolution. Cultural revolution, okay, yeah. So by that time, he's kind of living like an emperor in Zhongnanhai in Beijing, and he's very isolated from the common folk in many ways. Yeah, we'll get to Mao losing touch with society much later. But yeah, at least in this early period when he's more hands-on, he's really thinking about the things that are around him, basically, like things in his everyday life that he actually sees and interacts with. So after these early writings, uh, you do see more socialist ideas. Now, not necessarily communism yet or Marxism, but socialism more broadly um, after uh, 1919. So there is a scholar named Maurice Meisner who uh, writes what I would consider like one of the best biographies of Mao I've come across. And I mean, the name is, well, Mao Zedong. Yeah. Very original, I know. <laughs> um, but so in Meisner's biography on Mao, Meisner argues that Mao's interest in socialism was initially inspired by anarchism. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of China scholars who would corroborate this. Arif Deerlik, who writes a book called The Origins of Chinese Communism, also argues that Look, during the May 4th movement, um, now the CCP, you know, looks back on the May 4th movement through rose-colored lenses and is like, yeah, Marxism was huge. But in reality, anarchism was really one of the main ideologies, much more so than Marxism. And you could argue that, I mean, Mao, too, was initially much more inspired by anarchism. 
Yeah, he's definitely not a Soviet. Like, he doesn't mention, really, the Bolshevik Revolution ever. I hesitate to say that because I haven't read everything that he's written, but I'm fairly confident that he doesn't talk about it. And most of what he writes about is about the peasants. This is sort of where we have to go back to Marxist theory and why Mao isn't a Marxist fundamentally. Because what Mao is concerned with is sort of the freedom of his own people. At one point, he actually advocates for the separation of Hunan when China's under the warlords. So um, he wants Hunan to gain its independence and he wants to improve the lot of the peasants, the people that he grew up with. And that has nothing to do with Marxism. Not really, and Marx had a pretty dismal view of the revolutionary potential of peasants to begin with, right? Marx is all about the, you know, urban proletariat, these industrial workers who are going to rise up. Um, Regarding peasants, he's like, meh, they're this feudal remnant, (laughs) they don't really have much potential at all, like, we don't really care about them, and this is the opposite of what Mao ends up advocating for. So he comes back from Beijing and he goes back to Hunan province. I think he's living in Changsha. He's not living in his hometown. Yeah, and this is when he founds um, that um, journal, the Xiang River Review, right? The one that only lasts five issues. Um, But it does gain him um, a a bit of a reputation, right? I mean, because here you have this guy writing these controversial (laughs) things and his journal gets banned. Like, who's not going to want to learn about that. Yeah, he's got sort of status anyway, because he's a teacher as well. So if you didn't know that, Mao's a teacher. He also studied a bit of accountancy. So, you know, he's fairly well-rounded. And he takes up all these smaller projects. So he tries to organise trade unions and get the workers and peasants to get better deals, basically. Ironically, he sets up a business. He sets up a bookstore. But I think it's a non-profit bookstore. So there you go. There's some idealism for you there. Um, So not too capitalist, right? Yeah. He sets up a bookstore. It's got several branches, I think, as well. To me, this is quintessential Mao. When I read Mao, I always think of him as someone who really likes, you know, tables. And he's really meticulous. He's very well organised. He's good at organising. He's good at planning. He's good at coming up with, like, a structure and running things very efficiently. One of his most famous works much later on is called Get Organised. So I think he's very of the mindset that, you know, if we just organise people properly, if we just put everything in place, come up with a real plan, take all the details down properly and meticulously record everything, then things will work out because we've got it set up properly. Right. And uh, you could argue that this is why um, his investigation on the peasants in Hunan is, um, well, some people consider it brilliant and then others are like, well, is it brilliant or is he just really good at organising large sets of data, right? (laughs) Not that the two are mutually exclusive necessarily, but... (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's also a great example, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, let's move on to talking about that. So what's the background of why he why does he bother writing this report on the peasants? Basically, what happens next to Mao? Oh, yeah. So Mao is present when the CCP is founded in 1921 um, in Shanghai. There's this great museum in Shanghai in this um, building in the French concession where the CCP was initially founded. And I mean, it's great. Um, very <laughs> Very, like, chock full, saturated with propaganda, um, not surprising. Um, Definitely elevates Mel a lot more than his actual status at the time. He was, like, a rather small fry. He was of, like, little importance, although he was actually there. Um, And so, you know, historians later have made a big deal out of this. Um, He's, I mean, a very, very early member of the CCP there from the inception. Uh, Pretty soon, um, right after... The Chinese Communist Party is founded under the aegis of the um, Comintern from the Soviet Union, right? The Comintern being the kind of international propaganda organ of the Soviet Union to kind of promote worldwide revolution. The Comintern decides that they also want to back the nationalists down in Canton. Well, and this is also because Stalin is interested in having a strong unified China nearby. But the argument is that... Well, you can't have a proletariat revolution unless you have a unified nation with a strong, growing bourgeoisie class. And to get to this point, we need to support the nationalists because, sorry, Chinese Communist Party, you guys just don't have much potential right now compared to these guys down in Canton. So there's this first united front that is formed. And 
This is not highlighted by historians in the PRC today, which is not surprising, but Mao actually ends up being a really enthusiastic participant in the first united front. So Chen Du Xiao is like moaning and groaning about this, but Mao is actually pretty on board with the Soviet Union strategy here. Um, so two things. First of all, you noted that the Soviet Union wants a strong unified China. For people who have forgotten, that's because Japan has occupied Manchuria. Uh, or is at least pushing into Manchuria towards this time. Japan's just causing a lot of ruckus in this period. They do actually set up a Manchurian government in, I think it's 1931, which we'll be talking about in a later episode. Yeah, so Mukden incident 1931, Manchurian government set up in early 1932, so, right. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, they're causing ruckus. Um, yeah, and after also the first Russia does war in 1905, right? They, yeah, exactly. they dominate the. Yeah, so Russia's not a fan of Japan because they recently lost a war to them, which is kind of embarrassing because Russia's huge and Japan's tiny. And so they kind of need this ally. And China would be a great ally. China, in the view of the Soviet Union, China's got a lot of potential uh, in terms of becoming a sort of communist state later on. Yeah, because they're kind of, you know, hobbling along at this point. The foundational structure of China has completely crumbled away. So there's kind of like a big void. And the the commentator's like, oh, we can fill this with communism. I think Mao's basically on board because he wants that strong China. He does, like we said before, his heroes were Kang Youwei and Liang Qichao. And what they wanted was to strengthen China. And so I think Mao is carrying on this sort of late Qing reformer early Republican idealism of, you know, we're the sick man of Asia and all we need to do is strengthen and, you know, we can get China back to its perfect, glorious past. So I think that kind of explains why he's a nationalist, well, uh, allied with the nationalists. Yeah. I mean, Lam Chi Chao was one of, if not the first mm. famous proponent of nationalism, like Chinese nationalism, like, hey, China's more than the Qing dynasty. So yeah. it makes sense that him being one of Mao's childhood heroes, Mao would then kind of adopt a lot of his ideas later on, right? And so Mao's working really hard producing propaganda for the nationalists at this point, just before they launch the Northern Expedition. Yeah, so uh, Mao actually has a pretty high position in the GMD, um, or KMT, Kuomintang Nationalist Party, all the same thing, which makes <laughs> Chinese history really, really fun. Yeah. Um, but so he has a really high position with the nationalists, even while he has growing responsibilities at the CCP headquarters in Shanghai. Well, he ends up actually being caught between a rock and a hard place mm -hmm. because he is trying really hard to strengthen this united front in which the communists are a quote-unquote block within, yeah. right? But um, he ends up being attacked by communists for being too pro-nationalist, mm -hmm. and he ends up being attacked by the nationalists for being the most visible communist member in the nationalist <laughs> party, so he just can't win. Yeah. Right, so then he retreats from his political posts in fall 1924 and takes a bit of a hiatus. Yeah, and this isn't something, again, going back to kind of the mythologizing slash erasure of history, you don't ever really read about the fact that Mao basically has to take mental health breaks quite a few times from his political work. It happens here, it happens just before they set up the Jiangxi Soviet in the early 1930s. You know, he's got small children at this time, his wife is at home, he's just had a, a new baby, but he does, you know, he's got it from all sides. You know, everyone's coming down pretty hard on him. And it's kind of difficult when you've got these big organizations who are, they're the ones who are trying to unite China. The nationalists, there's quite a lot of nationalists at this time. Their army is approaching half a million. I think it's half a million, something like that. But, you know, they, they're they working towards this big northern expedition. So to have all of these groups, Mao's basically standing alone at this time. So I think it's actually kind of justified that he would have a little bit of kind of a mental breakdown and be like, I can't take this anymore, guys. This is all just a bit too much. I'm going home. Makes me feel better when grad school gets too much for me. If Mao can take a mental health break, so can I. Exactly. Yeah, I've definitely got the weight of the world on my shoulders, at least reading about this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so he... Yeah, so I mean, Mao totally pieces out, right? And he doesn't even attend the fourth CCP Congress, which is in January 1925. Yeah. Um, and it's really the peasants, like him noticing peasant activity in his home province of Hunan. He really kind of, this really rouses him from his, I mean, you know, apathy, depression, exhaustion, whatever he's going through. He notices that these peasants are beginning to form unions mm -hmm. in the countryside. Mm -hmm. And this is what really starts getting him excited about political activism again. 
Yeah, exactly. So this is when he undergoes actual, again, back to the meticulous organised nature of Mal, he decides to undergo a um, sort of investigation. And he, um, I think he spends a month in his hometown or in a, the town next to his hometown. And he basically um, observes the peasants and their actions over it, it's I think initially it's a month but it may have been it may have like extended longer than that and he puts together this really detailed report and it's called report on the investigation into the peasants or something like that I always forget what it's called yeah it's a very long title right yeah it's a report on the investigation of a peasant movement in Hunan like depending oh, on yes. how you translate it but yeah um, yeah, so Mao becomes politically re-engaged in 1925. Um, his report is written in 1927. And like his propositions that he sets forth during this time period will become key components of Mao Zedong's thought when it crystallizes during the Yan'an years. In particular, the super unorthodox belief in the revolutionary potential of peasants, which uh, we mentioned is not Marxist at all. Most of the Chinese communist leaders at the time are also very anti-peasant. And here's where an ironic thing happens, which you no know, historians in um, People's Republic of China also do not emphasize. <laughs> Actually, the left wing of the Nationalist Party is far more sympathetic to the plight of the peasants and to Mao's vision at the time than the majority of CCP leaders are. Mm -hmm. So Mao actually devotes most of his time to nationalist activities mm -hmm. and doesn't really participate in CCP politics. So this is when he writes the report. Yeah, and yeah, he's really, it's very strange to think that, because obviously he didn't know that he was going to become the, you know, the chairman of the party, the grand leader of China, the liberator, etc. You tell the history like that now, but history is never so teleological as that. Yeah, exactly. Like, there's no reason really that the CCP wouldn't try have tried to get rid of him at this point. And maybe they would have gotten rid of him, actually, as a member, if 1927 and the White Terror and the betrayal of the Nationalists hadn't taken place. Right, yeah. So, I mean, Mao does his, you know, studies on the peasant movement in Hunan right before this white terror happens. So right before the, you know, big split between uh, the CCP and the nationalists. Mao brings out this report and he's basically ignored <laughs> by the true communists in the party because... This is going back again to the first idea that Mao isn't a Marxist. He doesn't really care about Marxism. He's just he's just in the Communist Party. His ideas have nothing to do with Marxism. <laughs> he hasn't studied the theory at all. So Li Dajiao and Chen Duxiu are like the real Marxist intellectuals in the party. But Mao is just kind of like, you know, going along, doing his thing. Yeah. Um, basing his ideology more on experience. And he's not just not a Marxist. His ideas actually kind of oppose Marxism to an extent. Right. I mean, you could even argue that he was a heretic from the standpoint of Marxist-Leninist ideology. I mean, one, he doesn't think that the proletariat has that much revolutionary potential, although he gets around this by later describing the peasant as having like a proletarian spirit or something. Mm -hmm. So they have a class yeah. consciousness. So even though they're not the proletariat, since they have the spirit of the proletariat, it still kind of counts. So <laughs> I think later in Yenon, this is what he argues, right? Yeah. So for him, the peasant is the main revolutionary class. And for him, so unlike Lenin, in particular, who was all about this revolutionary vanguard, and you need this kind of intelligentsia to lead the revolution, Mao is all about spontaneous revolutionary creativity. So this is also very unorthodox. Well, and plus, Marx is all about revolution starting in the cities, and Mao thinks it's going to start in the countryside, in the case of China. So, yeah, nothing to do with Marxism. It's no wonder that everyone in the CCP dislikes him, and a lot of the time they're trying to convince him as well to change his point of view. He does actually have friends uh, from his hometown, for example, Lili San, who I mentioned very briefly in a previous episode because he kind of comes in and comes out very quickly. But sort of higher up members of the party who are trying to convince him, you know, you should focus more on the cities. But I would argue that the white terror, the purge of the communists is actually Mao's sort of I told you so moment. Not that he knew that the nationalists were going to betray everyone, but just that there was more space or more potential 
in the countryside, whereas in the cities, there was less maneuverability, less of a stable base. Yeah, I mean, his analysis is pretty impressive. We were talking about, um, you know, his ability to manipulate and analyze, like, massive amounts of data, right? Mm -hmm. So he's very meticulously organized in this report and in dividing rural society into all these different economic classes based on, you know, their relation to both the means of production and the degree to which they are exploited. So you have these landlord and rich peasant classes, which are the exploiting classes. So he kind of ignores the fact that he's from a quote-unquote rich peasant background himself. (laughs) Um, You have um, the middle classes. These are the guys that own and work their own land. And poor peasants. And Mao thinks that the exploited class that has the most revolutionary potential is the poor peasants. Then there's something else called the lumpen proletariat, but we don't have to get into that too much now. Yeah. (laughs) At this point as well, his sort of viewpoint is changing. This is where the Mao Zedong thought takes another step forward. And he's moving away from that kind of bloodless revolution into, oh, hey, you know, maybe maybe there will be a little bit of bloodshed. Okay, so this is one of the most quoted passages that Mao writes, and it is from this report. So Mao says, a revolution is not a dinner party or not like writing an essay or painting a picture or doing embroidery. It cannot be so refined, so leisurely and gentle, so temperate, kind, courteous, restrained, and magnanimous. A revolution is an insurrection, an act of violence by which one class overthrows another. A rural revolution is a revolution by which the peasantry overthrows the power of the feudal landlord class. Without using the greatest force, the peasants cannot possibly overthrow the deep-rooted authority of the landlords, which has lasted for thousands of years. The rural areas need a mighty revolutionary upsurge, for it alone can rouse the people in their millions to become a powerful force. Summary, revolutions require bloodshed. And I really enjoy some of the language that he uses. For example, saying that the landlords are deep-rooted. So you can kind of equate that to be like, oh, they're like weeds on society, right? They've got their roots right into society and they have to be ripped out. So it is that forceful language, more militarist language. You know, he could have picked some of this up from his time with the KMT as well, because the KMT is very organised militarily, as opposed to the CCP, who kind of runs on propaganda at this point. And Mao gets a lot of his propaganda training, ironically, from his time with the nationalists that he employs (laughs) later on. So that's his report. His report is ignored, even though it's very well written, and he does all the tables and all the graphs and everything, and he really takes his time over it. (laughs) No one cares. (laughs) Yeah, he even proposes this program of rural revolution at the 5th CCP Congress, largely based on this report. But yeah, you're right, he's ignored. (laughs) (laughs) No one cares. Um, All the CCP leadership is still like, yeah, even though the white terror has happened, revolution is still going to take place in the cities, which doesn't quite make sense. But okay, it's orthodox Marxism, right? It always confuses me because... I understand that they're trying to stick to the orthodoxy of the ideology and they're being led in large part by the Soviets and they're being funded by the Soviets. But 90% of China is peasants. So you've got all this potential and they're completely uneducated at this point as well. They're all illiterate. You can argue that they're much more susceptible to, um, you know, being taught, which is what Mao finds later on. They're much more susceptible to being taught ideology if you can just give them some sort of base improvement in their standard of living. So it's a lot more easier than trying to combat the bourgeoisie and the merchants and the businessmen in the cities who have a grip not only on the economy, but also the politics. Right. Um, And yeah, I mean, the nationalists have their power bases in the cities, which are largely on the coastal areas. So it's a terrible place for the CCP to attempt to foment revolution. Yeah, they're being hunted all the time. (laughs) I mean, the CCP has to go underground in Shanghai. They still have, well, for now, for a few more years, they will yeah. have, you know, a an underground cell there. But I mean, yeah, they have to go into hiding. Yeah, and at some point as well, Li Da Zhao is actually executed as, you know, as part of this CCP revolutionary base. So no one's safe, really. So I don't know, that always just confuses me. <laughs> And, you know, there's some of the nationalists who try and support the CCP after Chiang Kai-shek you know, breaks ranks and carries out this, like, purge in Shanghai, which turns into the white terror, but Chiang Kai-shek has the military, so even though there are these leftists in the Nationalist Party who are like, hey, we support you guys, then they discover later, oh crap, we don't have an army, we can't actually do anything. So yeah, so while the city folk are all ignoring Mao, he's in the countryside, and he's actually trying to 
put you know his ideas into practice by organizing real life movements and uprisings yeah so actually his other most quotable quote political power grows out of the barrel of a gun Mm -hmm. is also first set forth during um, 1927 mao sees a chiang kai-shek and all that he's been able to accomplish with a strong military and thinks well we should have an army ourselves. So you see the birth of the Red Army this year. Mm-hmm. And then you do see Mao trying to foment a revolution in Hunan province with um, this kind of ragtag group of peasants that he gathers, but this fails. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's called the uh, Autumn Harvest Uprising. Yes, and it was actually that? helped by a female general, going back to this um, you know, feminist leitmotif. Um, yes. Li Zhen is the first female general of the Chinese People's Liberation Army, and so she helps Mao um, with these autumn harvest uprisings. Yes, exactly. See, I knew it. I knew Mao was a feminist. He really, I think he just believes in the potential of women. It's probably due to the women that he was exposed to in his childhood and growing up and stuff. He had a lot of female friends who went to school with him and they would write letters back and forth. So he definitely respected women as equals, not only intellectually, but also physically. To him, there was like no reason that a woman couldn't have been a general, which is kind of cool. It is kind of cool. Makes me want to like Mao a little bit more. I know. It's unfortunate. (laughs) Yeah, right? Nobody's perfect. Well, (laughs) understatement. But, so Mao does lead the small peasant army against the Hunan landlords, but is defeated, kicked out of the CCP's central leadership, and then he retreats to form his first, would you call it a Soviet? I mean, it's very small, this uh, Jinggang Shan uh, collective on the border between Hunan and Jiangxi. Yeah, I wouldn't call Jinggang Shan uh soviet only because i think at this point again mao is like hospitalized or something and also the main people who are running it he's kind of like in cahoots with these uh local bandits so he's i wouldn't argue that he was like in charge the way when he gets to the jiangxi soviet that he's really like running it and is able to get organized as he would like to say yeah that makes sense Right, and he's in Jinggangshan for two years. Okay, so I think it's at this point that he starts to argue for class consciousness, mm-hmm. right? Being more important than class. Like, you know, these uh, peasants or even like the lumpen proletariat, these bandits we have here, you know, maybe they're not exactly the industrial proletariat, but it doesn't matter because they have the class consciousness of the industrial proletariat. So I can still be a Marxist. Yeah. So yeah, so he he's in Jinggangshan. I would say that it's more like a rest and relax period. That's probably where he comes up with the class consciousness stuff as well, because he's not really doing anything. And then he goes, he takes his red army because they're basically throughout this period, they're always running away from KMT forces. And also in a previous episode, we've spoken about the encirclement campaigns, which is Chiang Kai-shek trying to eradicate the CCP altogether. So that takes place between, uh, I think it's 1930 or 1929 to 1934, 35, 30, 34. Yeah. So they're being chased around the country by the KMT and they basically settle in Jiangxi province, this like little town, and they set up their little Soviet. Right. So Mao and then um, Judah, who's a you know military commander, who's also a CCP member, but had been a military commander under the first United Front before it broke apart. They're the two leaders in Jinggangshan and the peasants get them confused and <laughs> what, they just call them like Mao Zhu or something because they're like these two main dudes who are in charge, but no one exactly knows who That's they amazing. are, right? <laughs> Yeah, so then they flee to form this Jiangxi Soviet on the border of Jiangxi and Fujian provinces, um, right? And these border regions are, well, I mean, they're bandit hideouts, pretty much. They are not very well, you know, policed. It is very hard. They're very rural, right? There are not many people living out there. So if you want a place to hide out, these border regions, which are often, I think, well, there's a reason why they're border regions and why there are not many cities there. A lot of the terrain is not really suitable for long-term settlement. Like, I know a lot of these bandit layers are in caves, for instance, and it's very, like, mountainous and remote. Um, They're living living very rough at this period in time. And also they have all their communications cut off as well, so they can't even stay in touch with the CCP who are back in the cities. And also Mao loses touch with his first wife, 
Yang Kai Hui at this point because she was left behind somewhere. But he gets a new wife at this point. Um, her 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 Ji Chen, I think her name is. Can't remember. Man, now with so many wives, it's easy to forget. Yeah, I think he gets four in total, and you know, mysterious things happen to all of them except for Jiang Ching. But yeah, like I said, we'll get to her much later. So at this point, the main CCP is back in Shanghai. Mao's in the Jiangxi Soviet, and he's trying to kind of make it a livable working commune. And this is also one of his. I, I don't want to say childhood dreams, but he he did want when he was a young man to set up a sort of commune in Hunan province as well. And again, it wasn't based on the ideas of communism. It was just he felt that a more self-sufficient, isolated way of living within a harmonious community. I guess it's kind of based on the anarchism ideology. Communism, so. right? Yeah, although he yeah. had not studied these, so he wouldn't know. But it is like a lot of... 19th century Russian populism too. Exactly. And so that's where we'll end the first half of this two-part exploration of Mao Zedong thought. The second episode should be out on the 8th as opposed to the 15th as it normally would be, but as you can see it's quite a long conversation so I'll see how I get on. If you want to find out what happens to Mao in his Jiangxi Soviet and discover how the events of the Long March transformed his way of thinking, make sure you tune into the next episode. Bye for now. <laughs>